if you have not turned your phones off, if you could help us with that, we would appreciate that. And we will dismiss all the little guys eight and under. If you have your Bibles this morning, go to Deuteronomy 33. And if you have a piece of paper or some way to mark that place, to hold that place, we'll, um, we'll look at a few different passages of Scripture this morning. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Let Reuben live and not die, and let, his, and let not his men be few. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning. Bless as we look at your book. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning. Um, verse 1, it says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he goes through this chapter, and uh, uh, most of this chapter is dedicated to just blessings that were pronounced on the various tribes. Um I want to talk to you this morning on this thought. Who wants a blessing? Who wants a blessing? I think everybody in the room would say a big hearty yes to that. Um, you know, Moses in this chapter is literally on the verge of his death. And he knows it. Now, Moses did not die of, of weakness or disease. Uh, the Bible says that at the end of Moses' life, he was... He was a lot like Caleb. Caleb at the age of 80 says, I am as strong for battle this day as in those days 40 years ago when, when we were first going to go to battle. That's really an amazing statement. And it says about Moses that his eye was not dim and his natural force was not abated. Moses is 120 years old here. Man, I'd like to be able to say that 120. Um, uh, and But Moses is... Um, He's not going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. That's going to be Joshua's job. Moses pronounces this blessing. And then uh, uh, shortly after this, God says to Moses, Moses, come up to Mount Pisgah to the top. He says, I'm going to let you see the land at a distance. And he says, and then I'm going to take you home. And literally, that's what happens. God takes Moses to the top of that mount. He shows him all the land of Canaan from, you know, a distance. And, uh, and literally... God says, OK, Moses, it's time. And he breathes his last breath. And it says, and God buried him somewhere in that land. And uh, it's interesting, you know, you, you these little details that don't seem to mean much to us. But uh, the Lord put a hedge around that whole area and never let the devil see where he would buried Moses. And that bothered the devil. And you find that out. In, at the end of the New Testament, because it says the devil disputed with the archangel over where that body was. And uh, so Moses was blessed. Moses had the greatest funeral any man could ever have. But here in this chapter, he's pronouncing a blessing. The last thing he does after 40 years of leading the children of Israel, the last thing he does is to pronounce a blessing on all these folks that he has led and loved and prayed for and helped on their journey. The last thing he does is pronounce a blessing. 
You know, in the Bible, you see this in a few places. And these blessings were always very significant. And they were very prophetic. You see it in, um, you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 48 and 49, Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph. And then he blesses the rest of his sons. And that, that is another amazing passage. Go to Genesis 27 for just a moment. Seems like some of these guys really had uh, an unusual God-given ability at the end of their life to um, to pronounce a blessing. Now, you and I do that. We, we, we bless each other. We pray for each other. We hope the best for each other. But um, we, can't, we can't say something uh, that's really going to make a difference for the rest of your life and then for the rest of your generations. All we can do is sort of wish you the best. And that's our way of giving a blessing. But when these guys did it, man, it was it was the voice of God Almighty. And um, and it was a lot more than just wishing somebody the best. Um, it was very significant. Look at um, Genesis 27, verse one. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, my son. And he said unto him, behold, here am I. And he said, behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now, therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee. Before I die. So a lot of you guys know the story. Um, Esau leaves to go out and get that deer meat for his dad. And uh, Rebecca gets wind of this. And um, Rebecca says to Jacob, she says, Jacob, I want you to get that blessing. And man, she she manipulates the situation. And, she, and of course, Jacob's right in on it because that's part of his nature. And um, and he goes in and pretends that he is Esau. And um, Isaac is a little unnerved because, because the voice doesn't sound like Esau's. You know, it says here, Isaac, his eyes were dim so that he couldn't, he's an old man and he's blind. And he thought, man, this, this doesn't sound like Esau. He said, art, art thou truly my son Esau? And he said, yes. Can you imagine? I bet, I bet. Jacob was sweating bullets. And then he says, come here, my son. And he reaches around and touches him. And Rebecca had put sheep's wool. Somehow she had managed to get it on there. So it, it felt legit. Because Esau was a hairy man. And Jacob was not. And he had some of Esau's clothes on. And he said, man, he said, this, this is strange. He said, it sounds like Jacob, but he said, but it feels like Esau and it smells like Esau. And so then what does he do? He gives him the blessing that should have been Esau's. Look at verse 26. This is Jacob. It says, And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as a smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee 
and blessed be he that blesseth thee. But he's boy, he said a lot in those two verses. He's covered his life for generations to come. Verse 30. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to them, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him, yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. You know, you just keep seeing that word bless as we read down through here. This, this blessing that these guys gave at the end of their life, it was, it was huge. It was, it was a big deal. Verse 35. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice. And in the verses that follow, uh, you know, um, Isaac sort of does the best to, to choke out another blessing, but it's nothing compared to the blessing of the firstborn. And it is nothing compared to the blessing he'd given Jacob. And it says, you read on, that Esau hated Jacob because of the, the puny blessing that he had received. One of the last things that, that Moses does is he pronounces a blessing. You know, this blessing these guys would give at the end of their life, it was one of the mountain peaks of life. And it was a, a blessing that would determine somebody's future for generations. Moses is standing in front of that whole group and he sees a, a vast age group and he wants to see them all blessed. And for some of these, as you read down through chapter 33, Deuteronomy, for some of these, the blessing was small and earthly and it wasn't real specific and it wasn't really spiritual in nature for some of them. And yet for others, it was huge and detailed. And here's Moses at the end of his life. And boy, it's interesting. Moses is not consumed with his end here. You know, as far as Moses is concerned, he has fought a good fight. He's run the race. He's finished his course. He's ready to go. That's a good place to be. He is not, uh, he's not begging God for extra time. He's not distracted by thinking, oh man, What's God going to do after in the next chapter or two? He's not distracted by that. He is looking at their future, the people of God. And the Holy Ghost begins to speak through him. And what does the Holy Ghost do? He will show you things to come. He declares the end from the beginning. Look at um, Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. Verse 10. What do you think of when you think of Moses? You think of him of leading God's people and maybe being the meekest man that ever lived, you know, but you always think of him leading Israel. But look what the Lord says in Deuteronomy 34, 10. 
And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Lord called Moses one of the greatest of the prophets. You don't, you don't think of him as a prophet. I don't. I think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. The Lord said, you know, there's, there's no prophet like Moses. Moses was a living picture of Jesus Christ. In chapter 34, he's called a prophet. In Exodus 32, he's a priest. And, and we'll see it in a few moments if we get that far. In verse 5 of chapter 33, he was called a king. Prophet, priest king man he was a real picture of jesus christ and the spirit of christ was in him and we know that first peter tells us that a man in deuteronomy 33 the spirit of god speaks a blessing the spirit of christ wants the best for his people you know in this room this morning um if you're saved, you're, you're God's people, hands down, unquestioned, forever. Man, you've passed that line. You've been birthed in the family of God. You know what he wants for you this morning? He wants the best for you. He wants to bless you. Look at chapter 33, verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came. The Lord. You know where this blessing starts with? It starts with the Lord. Um, if you're going to have a blessed life, you know, uh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start with the Lord. Um, you know, you'd like to have the rest of your life blessed. I'd like to have the rest of my life blessed. And um, that's all going to start somewhere. And that's going to start with the Lord. There's a couple songs. I uh, used to hear this a lot. Um, there's an old, I don't know if you want to call it a chorus or not. It's called the doxology. And it says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We sing that song, come thou fount of every blessing. And all blessing starts here. Twice in verse 2, it says the Lord came. It says that at the beginning of the verse, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of his saints. You know, uh, the Lord has come to us. In this verse, it says he came from Sinai, he came from Seir, he came from Paran. And these are places where if you, we, we took the time to look it up, there are places where God came to earth in a display of his power. And it says he came from Sinai and rose up from Seir. It says he shined forth from Mount Paran. Um, the Lord shined. Man, there's so many verses that talk about the Lord and um, who he is as far as how he shines. It says God is light. It says one day the shadows will flee away. It says in that land where we're going, there is no night there. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he turned around and he looked at his disciples and he said, ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. And uh, so, and, and what is this light that we have as believers? In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul said, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know what God does? Uh, you, know, you know, I know it wasn't real shiny this morning, but uh, boy, there's a lot of mornings. You know, you get up and I get up and what a blessing it is. Uh, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes how pleasant it is for your eyes to behold the sun. And um, you get up in the morning and you wake up, you see that sun, it's hitting your wall or it's coming into your living room and you don't have to guess where it is. It's not hard to find. If you're looking for the Lord this morning, uh, if you're having trouble finding him, I'm really not sure exactly why because he's not hard to find and he shines. He shines. This chapter starts off and it says, and this is the blessing 
wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel. But he doesn't start the blessings until verse 6. Verse 6 says, let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. So that, that's where the blessing starts. Why didn't the Lord go straight from verse 1 to verse 6? Why, why doesn't it say, and this is the blessing of the man, uh, Moses, the man of God, let Reuben live and let not his let not let him not die. Why did he do that? The Lord wants us to know where blessing comes from and how it comes. Do you want a blessing? Do you know where that comes from? Man, what, what an awful thing. Boy, there's some people, it just seems like everything they touch just, you know, it, it just, it fails. Um, and I realize, man, you know, the, the life is full of ups and downs. You know, I, we, we all understand that. Um, you know where the blessing comes from. You know, you got some plans, you got some thoughts, you got some dilemmas, maybe that you're in even right now. And you know what you want? You want the Lord's blessing. Um, you know where that comes from? It comes from him. Verse two. The Lord came from Sinai. The Lord loves to come. He loves to visit his people. You know, we just celebrated Christmas. He came to the shepherds. He came to Joseph. He came to his own. He came to his world. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And that was God coming to his world. The Lord loves to come to his people. In Mark chapter 6, the disciples are going across that sea, and it says they were toiling and rowing. They were having a hard time. They were rowing into the wind. And it says about the fourth night, about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea. It says in Deuteronomy 33 that he came. That's way back then. He came with 10,000s of saints. And history has a way of repeating itself. And often things in the scripture have a double fulfillment. You'll see that a lot in the prophets. You'll see a prophecy that, you know, about Israel and about something that was about to happen. And there was an immediate fulfillment. But there was also another fulfillment that would come much later. You see that with Joseph and Pharaoh's dreams. You know, Joseph is sold into slavery and, and uh, he's in the prison. And um, he gets called out to, uh, to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And Pharaoh has this dream. And in his dream, there's seven cows that are healthy and fat fleshed and strong and just ready for butchering. And they're just perfect cows. And, 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 and in the dream, seven cows, seven sickly starving cows come up and they devour the, the big cows. And then, then there's the dream of the seven ears of corn and they're full and good and, and perfect. And, and then seven thin ears withered and blasted and damaged. And they devour the, the good ears. And Joseph says, the dream is one. There were two things there. But he said, the dream is one. He said, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh. And it's because the thing is established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, it says he came with ten thousands of his saints. But, you know, there's another reference at the end of the Bible that uh, almost identical to that. Keep your place there and go to Jude chapter one. Jude is the book right before Revelation. The book of Jude starts off, verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you 
and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So that the book starts off and it's present tense. Jude is writing to uh, some folks at that time. And um, th this book is dated about 66 AD. And so it's a, it's a book at the time of the early church. And it was a present tense warning. I mean, it was very applicable to them right then. But you get down to verse 17. And it says, But beloved, rem remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. So all of a sudden you have a, a warning and an instruction for the last time. And so wedged in the middle of that is verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You have this, this thing that's brought up from way back. And he says, remember what Enoch said. He said, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And the thought was, it'd be at the end and it would be for judgment. He cometh, that's future, with ten thousands of his saints. You know, the one who is the fountain of all blessing, Cain. And he is yet coming. But the number is interesting there in chapter 33 and verse 2. It says, he came with ten thousands of his saints. You know, that's an interesting number because you would think the Lord would say ten millions of his saints or ten billions of his saints. There's been people around on this planet for at least 6,000 years. And we know that because you can trace the genealogies back and that takes you back to about 4,000 BC. And uh, man, throughout history, there's been lots of believers, lots of God's people. You, know, you got to remember the days before the flood when people lived to be a thousand years old. Uh, and you can imagine um, all the children and the man, just the, the hordes of people that would be born in a long lifespan. And not only that, there's been lots of movements of God throughout time, throughout history. You'd think God would have said 10 millions, but it's as though God looks through time and by comparison, he sees a small number. The Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. The Bible says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. The straight gate, if, if somebody says, man, I'm in a straight, that means you're in a tight spot. And that straight gate, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. In the book of First and Second Peter, in both those books, Peter makes reference to the times of Noah. And he says, few were saved. He says, Noah was the eighth person. And he brought in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So, so man, comparatively, there was a small number compared to the masses. You know, Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Lord looks at his disciples in Luke chapter 12 and he says, fear not, little flock. The Lord knoweth their, them that are his. Look at verse 2. He shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of his saints. 
From his right hand went a fiery law for them. From his right hand. The Bible says his right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. That the right hand of the Lord is the picture of victory and power. Um, he talks about how he saves by his right hand, how he holds us up by his right hand. And out of that hand, he gave something to his people. From his right hand went a fiery law for them, a fiery law. And that fiery law was intended to be a blessing. It is a fiery law. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a passing law. It's not a temporary law. It's not a changing law. It's not a cultural law. It's not a negotiable law. It's not a tame law. It's not an unenforced law. It's not a forgotten law. It's not smoldering. It's not sitting in ashes. It's not in a museum somewhere. It is a fiery law. It would never lose its intensity. And, and that's because of the person it comes from. It says, for our God is a consuming fire. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. And it talked about how his fiery indignation would devour the adversaries. You know, it was a fiery law. You know what the Lord did with that fire? He led them by night by a pillar of fire. It's a fiery law. Um, and, and that fiery law holds some real blessings for you and me. Um, instantly, some people, their their mind drifts into this thing where they, they think of something hard and something really negative. But that fiery pillar showed the way. That, that fire repels the enemies. You know, if you're out in the bush, you go camping in the foothills of the Rockies. And, and uh, you know, one of the things you're concerned about is, uh, is cougars and grizzlies and all that stuff. You know, um, the animals aren't always afraid of you, but they are afraid of fire. That fire repels the enemies. That fire is a place of safety. It is a fence of safety. God's word is a fence of safety. It is a place of liberty. David said, I will walk at liberty because I keep thy precepts. You stay inside the confines of, of his law, and man, there's great liberty there. That fire destroys the impurities. Fire drives away the cold. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 1. From his right hand went a fiery law to them. The Lord said in Jeremiah, Is not my word like as a fire, mm -hmm. saith the Lord. It's a fiery law. You know, if you ever see that law for what it is, uh, it, it, it does something to you. It'll warm you up. It'll heat you up. It'll um, it, it, it'll do something to you. If, if you know, God's law is, is a very tame thing to you, it's a... You know, it's your. You need to you need to talk to God about that. It's it's a fiery law. Look at Revelation one verse twelve. The Lord Jesus has just been speaking, and um, in Revelation one verse twelve, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven gold, golden candlesticks. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like into fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. In verse 17, John said, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. You know, uh, there's something fiery about the, the resurrected Lord, the glorified Lord. And when John saw him, he saw that. And um, man, he fell at his feet as dead. And yet the Lord looks at him and um, he says, 
Fear not. Fear not. Um, man, if, if you're his, uh, he's that, that fiery law and the fieriness of who he is. It's a blessing. It's meant to be a help. It will help us. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 33 again. The end of verse two. From his right hand went a fiery law for them, the end of verse 2. And then it says, yea, he loved the people. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing that he instantly puts those two thoughts together. You know, um, you, you wouldn't, uh, I don't know, I, I don't think I would. I wouldn't put his fiery law and his love together. But on the heels of one, he introduces the other. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. And that law was not to torture them. It was not to be a threat to them. It was not to bring judgment upon them. It was for them. A fiery law went out to them. It would bless them. It would lead them. It would protect them. It would keep them in the way. It would repel the enemies. A fiery law. And, and then he says, yea, he loved the people. Um, you know, sometimes in our minds, we have a hard time reconciling this, but a fiery law does not cancel his love. You know, we have a generation of, of Christianity that they really want to, they want to put the fire hose on his fiery law. But God says, no, let it burn. Let it burn. Amen. Moses comes out in the wilderness and God wants to speak to him and show him the greatest peace of his life that would ever be. Moses has been out thinks he's forgotten by God because he had to leave Egypt 40 years earlier because he took things in his own hands and made a mess of things and killed an Egyptian. He shouldn't have done it. You know, we do that sometimes, don't we? We take things in our own hands and we always make a disaster. And you think all is lost and he goes out to the backside of the wilderness. Thank God there was a place that he could go. But you know, after a few years, that got pretty old. It got pretty lonely. I can't imagine being more lonely than being on the backside of a, of a wilderness with nobody there for 40 years. Oh, hey, all your plans for serving God and all your joys and all your peace and all that you thought was going to happen, you, you've, done, you've done relegated that to the junk pile. But when God wants to show him and give him the greatest call of his life, God shows up in a bush that's on fire. You know what God wants to do with his fiery law? He wants to set you on fire. And he wants to show you the greatest days of your life. And it'll start with something on fire. Those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were sad. They were broken hearted because Jesus had been crucified. And Jesus draws up and he, he disguises himself. And he begins to talk with them and and then all of a sudden, the darkest day of their life turns into the brightest day of their life. And when Jesus vanishes, they said, Did not our heart burn within us? His fire is no threat to you. You love Him. No, that's... You know that fire. Wow. Some people see the fire and they go, "Wow!" You know, Moses turned aside to see that it, there was this bush on fire and it wasn't consumed. And he said, what is this? And some people see that fire and they go, wow. Can you imagine being the children of Israel out in the wilderness? And every night there was a pillar of fire. You know, not a flicker of a candle. There was a pillar of fire. God knows how many hundred feet high. And that represented God with them. God said, I'm here and I'm going to lead you and I'm going to take care of you. And your enemies out in the distance. Hey, the Canaanites in the distance, they saw that. They knew the history. You think, how did they know the history? How did they know? They come into Canaan. They come into Jericho. And Rahab says, we, we heard about the crossing of the Red Sea. That had been 40 years earlier. We heard about it. How did they know about all that? All those people out in the distance, they saw every night. You know what they saw? A pillar. A fire. 
I'm sure they sent their scouts out. What is this? And people were on mountains and hills in the distance going, look. And then, and then in the daytime, when the sun came up, they could see the tents of the thousands upon thousands of Israel camped in the wilderness. And they said, boy, there's something amazing about these folks. So we don't want to get too close. That fire didn't look real friendly. But that fire is friendly if you're his. God says, I got a gift for you. He said, I got a fiery law. It'll make your heart burn. He said, I, 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 I came and I came to give you a fiery law. And he says, and by the way, he said, I love you. He gave them from his right hand, the hand of his power, went a fiery law. And it says in the next breath, yea, he loved the people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through. Hey, one day the fire will burn the adversaries up. But for now, that's not what he's after. Ephesians 2, for his great love wherewith he loved us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hereby perceive ye the love of God because he laid down his life for us. A fiery law does not cancel his love. It's interesting here. He talks about his saints in verse 2. And you see a description of his saints. Who is it? Who is it that gets the blessing? His saints. Do you want a blessing? Who is it that gets the blessing? It's his saints. We know in these verses he, he tells who they are. In verse 2, he gives them a fiery law. And the people that receive that law, the people that love, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. The people that love that law, they're his saints. His great love, they're the people that he has loved. Look at verse 3. Yea, he loved the people. And there's no, there's no period in any of these statements in verse 3. He loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. We are safe. Who are the saints? We're the ones that are safe in his hand. You know, you know how close God's control over your life is? It says it's, it's in his hand. The God in whose hand thy breath is. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man shall pluck them out of my Father's hand. You know, how, how safe are you? Uh, well, you're, you're in his hand, and, and the son's hand is in the father's hand. And, uh, you know, you, uh, and some, 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 please forgive me, some dingling will say, no, yeah, but uh, you can jump out. Yeah, I've never known any of God's people that wanted to try that. And I have a feeling, it says, he holds worlds in his hand. He made the stars with his fingers. I really don't think you can jump far enough to get out of the hand. You might make a mess, but you're not jumping out. You know how safe you are? If you're a, if you're a saint, you're in his hand. Praise the Lord. That's a good place to be. It's a good place. And it doesn't depend on you. It's in his hand. And this morning, you, you know what y'all did? You grabbed your keys. You grabbed your keys. You know what? Uh, I grabbed my keys. I initiated that move. They're, they're not going nowhere. Now, the problem is I'm human. I might get weak. I might fall asleep and I might drop them. But he that keepeth Israel, Psalm 121, shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You know who his saints are? They're in his hand. Yeah. Are you, are you safe this morning? You're in his hand. You're in a good place. Verse 3. And they sat down at thy feet. You know who the saints are? They love sitting at his feet. They want to hear his words. You know, it says Mary sat at the feet of Jesus Christ. And the Lord said that was a good place to be. 
at the end of the verse, it says, everyone shall receive of thy words. And, and he, keeps, he keeps that thought connected. He says, thy words, verse 4, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. You know, um, we, the saints, they're, they're the ones that, that love his law, that love his law. Um, you know, I, I realize, you know, somebody can backslide, get away from God and all that stuff. But, but, you know, there's something in a believer that, you know, you just never get away from that. You still love, you still, I had a friend of mine that lost his marbles for a while, like he, he really did. And I uh, don't know why, don't know how to explain all that. Uh, he was a great guy, had a big family. Um, uh, at one point, had been on deputation to go to the mission field. And, uh, and then that really didn't pan out. And, and you know, maybe, maybe he really wasn't called to do that. So then he took a church in a, in a northern state. And, and uh, he was one of those guys that he was a blessing. I, I loved hearing him preach. He attended our church. And whenever the pastor was going to be away, you know, uh, when I found out he was preaching, we had several guys that could fill the pulpit. But when I found out he was preaching, I was like, yes. I, he just he had a gift. I mean, it was it was going to be good. That's just the way it was. And um, one day he lost his marbles. Like. One day he quit church and he, they quit homeschooling their kids and he, he had several beautiful blonde teenage daughters. He threw them in the public school. Like they, they you know, that the predators would be like, wow, look at this. We got all these innocent young girls. As a dad, how could you do that? But he, but he lost it. He lost it for a while. And, um, and somebody that worked with him said during that, during that time period, he'd be at the job site. He did construction work. Now, remember, he's quit coming to church. He's thrown it all out the window for a little while. He, he came back. But for a few months, man, he was just out in the wilderness. And he was trying to forget it all. And one of the guys was working with him. He said, yeah. He said, I caught him. said he was working away. And, and this guy always whistled. And he would always sing to himself, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And out of the blue, he starts whistling you know, amazing grace or blessed assurance. And he got about three bars into it and he stopped. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> Do you know why I did that? Because it was in his heart. Christ in you. If any man be in Christ, <laughs> he's a new creature. And the old man's still there and he still rises up. But you're still in his hand and his Holy Ghost is in there and he's still working and he loves his children. They love his law. They love his law. And his saints also know something else. Look at verse four. It mentions Moses. Moses commanded us a law. And you jump down to verse 5. And he, Moses, was king in Yeshua. You know what? Uh, Moses never claimed to have any title. Um, it's like John the Baptist. John the Baptist, somebody said, who are you, John? And he said, oh, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, yes, he was the voice of one, which is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. But Jesus said, do you remember in the prophets they talked about Elijah would come? He said, this is Elias, which was for to come. And John didn't even recognize it. You know, uh, Moses didn't have a throne. You know, Moses didn't have, you know, uh, he wasn't anything like the other kings uh, in the Bible. There was, there was never any time where Moses sat on the throne. There was never any time where anybody ever called him a king. But God looked and said, he was king. He was king, Jeshua. And you know what? Uh, the people followed his lead. Those men, they, they cried out and they murmured against him and everything. But God always just vindicated Moses and kept things going. Do you know what the, the saints know? They know who their king is. They know who their king is. Um, in Acts chapter 7, it speaks of Moses and it talks about the children of Israel. And it's the only time it's ever called this. It calls that congregation 
that was wandering. It called them the church in the wilderness. And pray tell, who is the head of the church? It's the Lord Jesus. Moses was the head of the church in the wilderness. And the Bible says, and he was king. You know, if, if you're one of God's saints, you know who your king is. You know, uh, we've, we've all got our leaders and we've all got some people that we, so, you know, in our land that we grudgingly try to submit to. And uh, you know what we would all gladly say? Thank God they're not our king. But we know who our king is. We know who our king is. In verse 5, it says, And he was king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Gathered together. You know what, uh, you know what the saints do? They gather. They gathered on earth. And there's another gathering coming. And he describes this, these people as ten thousands of his saints. You know who the saints are? Look with me real quick and we're done. Second Thessalonians one. Do you want a blessing this morning? Man, uh, you need to be one of his saints. You need, to, you need to be one of his people. But you need to recognize where the blessing comes from. You know, sometimes we, like we said earlier, we, sort, we, we tend to take things in our own hands and, and we forget. We forget. You know, we, we, we want a blessing. We, we want to live. We want to see, you know, God prosper things and we want to see our desires. And, and, um, and you know, we, um, you, you can lose sight of the fact that, you know, God is well able to bless you and God wants to bless you and he is the blesser. Um, look at 2 Thessalonians 1. The context is Jesus Christ and his coming. Verse 9 talks about the judgment that will occur when he comes, but verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 1.10, when he shall come, that's Jesus Christ, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. You know what? Uh, it says in the interesting verse 10, he will be glorified in his saints. You know, um, you know who saints are? They're the people that admire him. They're the people that know that they are nothing, but he is everything. And um, they know that now and forever, you know, you know, the, 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 the joy of their heart is to honor him. You know, we sang in here this morning and, um, and boy, the, the words, every time we get together, um, you start singing. And if you, if you think about what you're singing, uh, man, if you, if you came in here, um, it, it reminds you about the Lord and, and there's something about that, that, you know what his saints do? His saints love to honor him. Um, he is our everything. He is our everything. As a believer, Paul said, he said, he said, I count everything I've ever done, but loss. He said, everything I've ever gained. He said, when I look at the Lord Jesus, he said, my heart yearns to know him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If you want a blessing this morning. This day. If there's anything you can do to honor him. You know, is, is there something in your heart, some something you need to, something you need to do, something you need to say, something you need to write, uh, something you need to push out, something you need to bring in, something you need to step up to the plate on? You know, uh, is there something you could do that today would bring honor to him? Maybe it's just a matter of, uh, maybe it's just a matter of 
taking a few minutes and slowing down and getting alone for a few minutes and shutting out your bills and shutting out your schedule and shutting out the black clouds and 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 just uh, praising him because he loved you and he saved you and he's keeping you in his hand and he gave you a fiery law and he's got the rest of your life. He's got your steps planned out if you'll if you'll walk in those steps. Maybe, maybe you just, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Maybe that's what you need to do. And he's the one that will bless your life. I, I, I just, if there's something you, you're afraid of doing, you know, like something, something you really know you should do, something maybe the Lord's dealing with your heart about, but there's something you're just, you're afraid to do it. Can we promise you something this morning? Can we say something? If you'll haul off and do it, you know what's on the other side of it? A blessing. The Lord said, them that honor me, I will honor. If you'll do that thing that you're, you're afraid of for him. I'm not talking about something rash or something crazy. It's usually something really simple. That thing you're afraid of, if you'll do it. The God who made heaven and earth has a blessing for you. You know what God wants to do for all his people? He wants to bless them. And that's you. Let's pray. Lord, help us as your people to think rightly of you. And Lord, I pray you'd help us this morning. I pray that this morning you'd help us all to see you as the fountain of every blessing, Lord. And God, I think everybody wants a blessing. God, help us to realize you have tons of them. And Lord, you're just waiting to give them. You're looking for people to bless. Lord, you were looking this morning. And Lord, you've been here this morning. And God, you've got a blessing, a big one for everybody here. God, help us, Lord, to open our hearts. And help us to realize that's who you are. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as the piano plays, why don't you talk to the Lord? From his right hand went a fiery law for the people. Yea, he loved the people.
Lord, thank you that you love us and thank you, Lord, that you want to bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.